On Indian Lake, just north of Chafee's Lock, is an island with an old chimney standing among the trees, reminding us of the cottage that once stood here. It's an idyllic spot where children played and a family grew up. Few people would suspect that this peaceful island also once housed wounded soldiers returned from fighting in the trenches of the First World War. The soldiers were there to benefit from the island's peacefulness, but their minds strayed to horrifying images of trench warfare, images they could not put to rest. In 1901, the island is purchased for $300 by Kingston businessmen George and Henry Richardson. They are renowned for their father's grain exporting dynasty, James Richardson and Sons. The Richardson brothers build a large two-story cottage on the island, and they call it Fettercairn. George's family enjoys summers there for many years. After George dies, it passes to his daughter, Agnes, who later marries and becomes Agnes Etherington. The Richardson and Etherington families become locally known for their generosity and their involvement in Queen's University. In particular, Agnes will eventually leave her home in Kingston to Queen's University, as well as her art collection. This act launches the Agnes Etherington Art Center and the university's fine arts program. But in 1914, when she takes ownership of the cottage, she is 34, she is single, and she is Agnes Richardson. Agnes's ownership of the cottage is not like that of her father and mother. The year she takes over the cottage, her brother, also named George, goes off to fight in Europe. He is a captain in the 2nd Canadian Infantry Battalion. It is the start of the Great War. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. Agnes goes to visit her brother in London in 1915. She wants to contribute to the war effort. He tells her to go back to Canada and convert the cottage into a convalescent home for returning soldiers. Having already been at the front, he knows of the horrors there. Soon after Agnes's visit, he is killed fighting in West Flanders. Agnes returns home and throws herself into the task of getting the hospital up and running. She offers her cottage to the newly created Military Hospitals Commission. This new commission has been tasked with finding hospitals for the thousands of returning invalided soldiers. Partly using money left by her late brother, she hires a local contractor named Selby to fit up the cottage to receive patients. This involves opening up the second floor to create a 12-bed ward Selby also builds a bungalow for medical staff, and Agnes hires a doctor. She opens in May 1916. Agnes's cottage will be a seasonal hospital, operating from May to October. The patients arrive by train at Chafee's Lock Station and transfer to Fettercairn by motor launch. They receive soldiers with joint problems, tuberculosis, bronchial asthma, and neurological disorders, as well as other injuries and medical conditions. It soon becomes apparent that she needs a psychiatrist on staff. She brings in American Dr. Clarence B. Farrar, who provides psychiatric care in the second half of the 1916 season. By the end of 1916, Agnes has bought an additional 139 acres on the large nearby Scott Island. Selby builds another bungalow on this new property. The new bungalow is used to accommodate returning officers. 
When she opens in May 1917, she has some new staff, including a new psychiatrist, two graduate nurses, and three assistants from the Voluntary Aid Detachment. Among them, they care for an average of 28 patients at any one time. Soldiers requiring less regular medical attention are housed in military tents on Scott Island at what they call Fetter Cairn Camp. The new psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Mitchell, advises the military that Fetter Cairn is best suited for neurological cases, which are at the time called shell shock. Not well understood, shell shock is initially the term given by the military to soldiers who are physically injured by shrapnel from exploding shells. It is thought that the neurological effects are a physical brain injury. But as soldiers develop the same nervous effects who have not been close to an explosion, other theories are raised. One idea is that the psychological effects are caused by poisonous gases that are regularly being used in combat. Later, it is understood that this nervous psychiatric disorder is the result of prolonged and intense mental stress. In an effort to contain the potential flood of these sorts of injured to the rear of the fighting, soldiers who are suffering from mental collapse are sent for further care with the label NYDN, not yet diagnosed nervous. Among themselves, soldiers at the front say NYD stands for not yet dead. Symptoms are tremors and twitches, running wildly, a thousand yard vacant stare, a constant verbal flow of gibberish or repeated words, unaccountable crying, slack face muscles and other effects. Sometimes a major stressor, such as the loss of a close friend or a particularly gruesome attack, would magnify symptoms from a slight tremor to a full breakdown. Some soldiers are kept at the front and protected by their comrades. Others are sent to the rear and given what become known as bomb-proof tasks. But those not likely to be able to recover within a few months are sent home. Treatment in hospitals in Europe and Canada ranges from talk therapy and relaxation to a brutal array of intended cures. These include electric shock therapy, suffocation, and other inhumane procedures. Some soldiers return to the front while still suffering, simply to get away from this torture. But at Fettercairn, treatments are of a more moderate kind. By 1917, the Military Hospitals Commission in Canada has established more than a hundred hospitals and convalescent homes like Fettercairn for patients of all kinds. By that fall, Agnes has had built a large boathouse at Fettercairn. The boathouse has a big mess hall on the second floor, as well as a kitchen and a pantry. She also adds a shed to store the huge Delco glass batteries that provide the power for the facility. The plan is to provide a program that helps soldiers to recover and also to learn new skills that will enable them to rejoin normal home life. They are given gardening, sewing and sketching tasks. They are also taught farming skills such as raising chickens and milking cows. As well, they have access to canoes, rowboats and fishing gear that are intended to encourage the patients to relax and recuperate. Across Canada, there is some criticism from the general public about the military hospitals programs in these private homes and cottages. The feeling is that allowing these young men too much luxury and leisure will render them permanently unsuitable to re-enter the real world. In the meantime, Agnes brings family friend D.W. Baxter to Fettercairn. 
He is the secretary of the Rosedale Golf Club in Toronto. Baxter lays out a six-hole golf course at Fettercairn and also provides clubs and balls for the soldiers. In 1918, psychiatrist Dr. Mitchell returns to Fettercairn for the season. Patients who have recovered sufficiently are moved to Fettercairn Camp on Scott Island, where they will have more opportunities to be involved in work duties and activities in the outdoors. These patients resume a regular regimented schedule in their day-to-day -day life on the island. The program is deemed a success with six out of seven patients recovering sufficiently after two or three months to be discharged back to the military or to civilian life. The hospital operates again in the 1919 season. But after the war, Fettercairn returns to the family. It is quite built up by this time and no longer holds its original cottage atmosphere. Agnes lets the Girl Guides use it as a leadership training center. It is also used during the Second World War as a place for British home children to spend the summer. Today, the bungalow on Scott Island is used by Agnes's descendants. Fettercairn Cottage and Boathouse on the small islands are gone, except for the cottage's old chimney. All are private properties. Some estimates suggest 9,000 Canadian soldiers experienced shell shock during the First World War, but others put the number closer to 15,000, not including those killed before they can be diagnosed. About 300 of these shell shock patients passed through Fettercairn. In July 1919, the Department of Militia and Defence in Ottawa writes to Agnes. Dear Miss Richardson, as we are approaching the end of demobilization, it appears an appropriate time to express to you the thanks of the government for your great generosity in maintaining a hospital at Fettercare. I think I may justly say that you have been conspicuous among the most patriotic citizens of the Dominion, and that your kindness and liberality were a most potent factor in the successful treatment of neurological cases. The value of such service as you have rendered cannot easily be measured nor expressed, but it gives me sincere pleasure to convey to you the grateful acknowledgement of the Canadian government of all you have done. Believe me, yours faithfully, S.C. Newburn, Major General, Minister of Militia. For no guarantee, no freedom, to a tyrant yoke should bend, and a noble heart must answer to the same.